Where did you get the passion for religious liberty? Why is it so important to you? An EWTN News in-depth exclusive interview. Former Attorney General William Barr answers our questions, how his Catholic upbringing has impacted his views on education, democracy, and religious liberty. Putin, Putin is killing us. I curse him. May God give him the kind of hell he's giving us. EWTN News in-depth reporter Colm Flynn is in Ukraine as humanitarian aid is delivered to refugees there. He joins us with his first-hand account as he talks to those who seek safety. If you're curious about something, just go and check it out. There's no expectation from you come to Ash Wednesday Mass like I did, and it may very well, you know, like change your life. The rite of Christian initiation of adults. As we celebrate this Easter season, we talk to two women about their journeys as adults to become Catholic. We pray to God through, through the people that we know to be saints to ask God to, to enact miracles. And an exhibit of Catholic relics draws thousands to come to deepen their faith. EWTN News In Depth starts now. Well, it just became clearer to me through my life that uh, the framer's vision was correct, which is that limited government, their idea of limited government and maximum personal liberty was based on a foundation of religious liberty. Religious liberty as the foundation for a free society. Former Attorney General William Barr weighs in on the significance of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It was one of several topics we discussed in an exclusive interview for EWTN News In Depth. The former Attorney General has a long history of service to the United States under two administrations in very different moments in American history, and experience advising major tech corporations on government enforcement matters as a quickly growing industry changed from cable to wireless to digital. Barr is the second person in history to serve twice as U.S. Attorney General. He was first Attorney General under President George H.W. Bush from 1991 to 1993. During his tenure, he helped establish new enforcement policies in a number of areas, including for financial institutions, civil rights, and antitrust merger guidelines. From 1994 to 2008, Barr left the government and served as general counsel, leading the legal, regulatory, and government affairs activities for the GTE Corporation, which later became Verizon Communications. In 2019, Barr was sworn in as the 85th Attorney General under President Donald Trump. In this role, Barr was thrust into the spotlight, first as the Robert Mueller investigation into alleged Trump-Russia collusion was released, then again during the 2020 presidential election. In an unusual break with President Trump, Barr said the Justice Department found no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Barr recently released a book mostly documenting his service as Attorney General for President Trump, but also including his tenure under President Bush. It takes the reader behind the scenes of seminal moments during his career. The former AG sat down with us to discuss education, religious liberty, big tech, and the preservation of the peaceful transfer of power. Here's Bill Barr on the record. The way that you describe religious freedom, it's more philosophical than dogmatic. How has your Catholicism influenced your views on religious freedom? Well, uh, you know, I think all, I, I, I believe generally in religious freedom, and I think society's better off uh, with people believing, whether it be Christianity, Judaism, or, or any other religion. But uh, religion has always been a central part of my life. I was raised uh, in, the, in the Catholic religion. I went to Catholic school, grammar school, and uh, it gave me a strong foundation. And it, it was clear to me that um, uh, people thrive when they, when they have a religious foundation. Uh, it puts things in perspective for them. It tells them that there is a purpose to life and it helps them get through the challenges that every life has to face. And uh, so it's important that we preserve uh, uh, faith and in this secular age it's under attack. 
let's go back to something that you mentioned being raised in Catholic formation. Mm -hmm. You go to great lengths to thank the sisters that educated <laughs> you. Yeah. And you tell a beautiful story of reuniting with one of them. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the crisis of religious freedom has one kind of turning point, which is education. Why did you think that was so important? Well, because in, our, in the United States, we have public education. And in European countries, uh, you don't have to uh, give up sending your kids to religious schools in order to get publicly funded education. You mentioned England as one yes, of those England. examples. And you know, supposedly we fled England for religious liberty, but in England you can go to Catholic school, Church of England school, Muslim school, Sikh school, Hindu school, and it's paid for by the state. Uh, the United States, however, says you, if you, the only thing that's publicly funded are the state schools. Now that sort of worked in a clumsy sort of way for 100 years, from the mid-1800s to 1960, because they were fundamentally reflected to the Judeo-Christian tradition of the country. But um, since 1960, they first started stripping away Christianity, and now, over the last couple of decades, they've been trying to substitute secular ideology to explain morality and what they, you know, the the principles they think people should live by, and they're trying to in, in, interject into the school uh, doctrines and ideas that are fundamentally subversive of a religious viewpoint. And so that's one of the challenges that parents who want to raise their children in a religious faith face, the public school influence and indoctrination. You mentioned this secular ideology, secular humanism in your book, and how you have these new protections that were afforded for religion and now were afforded to secular humanism as a religion. Explain that to me a little more. Well, there are two clauses, as you know very well, in the Constitution. <laughs> There's the free exercise clause, which says that the, the state cannot uh, interfere with someone's exercise of their religion. And then there's the Establishment Clause, which says that the state cannot establish something as a religion. And I think we've gotten to the point that clearly are interfering in religion, so the Free Exercise Clause is implicated. But I think we've now gotten to the state where you could, uh, the, the situation where you can say that the government is establishing religion, a form of secular humanism. And in the past, they've treated that as a religion when, when it comes to getting out of the draft or something like that. They say, okay, well, you don't have to believe in God. That's really the equivalent of a religious faith. Now they're trying to establish secular humanism as sort of the official creed of the country, sort of a atheocracy. And I think that violates the Establishment Clause. So they're first given all of these protections for their speech and assembly and even not to have to participate in conflict, but then they're not in any way stopped the way that Christians and Muslims and Hindus, et cetera, are stopped right. by the Establishment Clause. Right. So that's problematic. Um, your chapter on religious freedom starts with a beautiful picture. It's actually a very scary picture of what aliens would think if they saw the Little <laughs> Sisters of the Poor. Right. How has this portrayal of the Little Sisters now synonymous with the fight for religious freedom shifted in your time, in your tenure in two administrations with a break in between, where religious freedom used to be one thing and now it's something else that vilifies people like the Little Sisters of the Poor, beautiful ladies. Right. Well, it, it goes back to uh, I, the threat today is not that people of faith are trying to impose their religion on other people. It's the opposite. It's that the secularists are trying to impose their viewpoints on people of faith, and they can't, just can't tolerate pluralism and people you know, having their own views and, and moral systems. And so they're trying to get, they take delight in having people who disagree with them and forcing them to bend the knee to you know, concede their point to engage, you know, doctors to participate in abortion, even if it's, a, you know, contrary to their conscience. Uh, or, you know, a, a baker who, uh, you know, bake a cake for a gay couple, even though that violates his conscience. They want people to bend the knee, and that is the danger to religious liberty. The use of coercion uh, against those of faith. You know, they say they didn't like it. They felt that when there were laws passed that restricted their activities, it was the religious views of the majority being imposed on them. But they're turning around and doing exactly the same thing they accused you know, religion of doing. 
Let's talk about your time at Verizon. You were general counsel of Verizon for about 15 years. You oversaw a merger, maybe two? Many, many mergers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did that time influence what you ended up having to do to curtail the effects of big tech or the beginnings of that? Well, certainly, uh, you know, it, it uh, taught me a lot about the new technology that was emerging, the internet technology. Verizon was at the forefront of that. And uh, it's changed the face of communications in this country. Um, so much of what we do now, whether it be shopping or education or research or uh, public discourse, is now done over the internet, digitally. And um, I've been concerned about the extent to which those markets are increasingly under the, the market dominance of just a handful of very, very large companies. And uh, it's something that I think there's bipartisan agreement. That's one of the things I found uh, in this uh, serving again, is that how much both parties are concerned about the market dominance of just a handful of companies. And they control what used to be the village green. The, you know, the public square is now a digital green. And they're ga they can be gatekeepers, and we see the censorship that's involved in that. And so we have to do something about it. And my book lays out some suggestions of what we can do. You talk about the three dangers that Google, Amazon, all of these companies pose. What are those three specific dangers? So the first danger is sort of the classical economic power, mm -hmm. their, uh, their uh, ability to uh, dominate those markets economically. Uh, the second ha has to do with their capture of all the personal information of their customers, the, the mountains of data they have about individuals, and their ability to use that to strengthen their position, but also to manipulate people. Unconsciously, people are sort of shepherded through the Internet because they know what buttons to push based on, on the information they have about individuals. So they can influence people. And then the, the, th the third danger is that we're not talking about a market for vacuum cleaners or toasters. We're talking about the market of ideas, the marketplace of ideas. As I say, the village green. And the framers believed that the great bulwark for our freedom was the multiplicity of voices and the fact there are just so many different sources. But as it becomes more concentrated, we lose that. We do lose that. And you mentioned that the regulators then, those who could be helpful in curtailing some of this, are 10 years behind the times. Right. So my experience in the, in the industry was that the most reactionary force in any marketplace are the regulators. They're usually about 10 years behind the time. And by the time they get around to addressing a problem, uh, the, the problem has changed in a way that is no longer susceptible <laughs> to the solution. So. Uh, that's one of the problems here. This has grown up right under the nose. This market power has grown up right under the nose of the of the regulators. Well, let's talk about some of the political players. Okay. I think that if we sit back, yeah. <laughs> we take a deep <laughs> breath. <laughs> Americans are feeling great unrest. They are feeling great uneasiness with the power of their vote. So I want to take the time now to ease their minds a little bit. What do you think tipped the scale? with the violence and the unrest in, in the last election um, and, the, and Biden coming into power. What tipped the scale there? Well, you know, going back to my confirmation hearing, I said in a very sharply divided country, we have to make sure there's integrity in our elections because people will not trust the outcome if they don't think it's fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have going for us is this peaceful transfer of power in our country. We can't lose that. And that's why I opposed all the, uh, you know, novel uh, practices that were being injected into the 2020 election. Because if people see the safeguards uh, diluted, they're not going to trust the outcome, whether or not you can prove fraud, if they feel that all the safeguards have been stripped away or weakened. So that's why it's important. And uh, now, there are a lot of different ways that the elections are skewed, can be skewed. Some are just a question of the level playing field. So, for example, if a party takes advantage of making rules that, you know, 
we're not going to use IDs or we're going to allow ballots that come in late and so forth. That's basically trying to give advantage to their constituency, a particular party. And the parties have to fight over that and make sure up front that the rules are, are fair because once those rules are adopted, those are the rules of the game. And we have to win or lose an election under those rules. To have a fair election, the rules have to be in place at the time of the vote because going back and trying to unscramble the egg is very hard to do. Trying to find the fraud, prove the fraud, or, 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 or yeah, improper voting. And so... And there are time limits on that. There are time limits. There's, in a presidential election, you only have five or six weeks between the time the election is over and the time the votes are certified. And so you really have to be disciplined and be ready to go in and challenge them after the fact. But the more important approach is to make sure the rules are proper and observed during the election or at the time of election. And there the parties have to be very active. Your career gives you full knowledge of the spectrum of what can be done by governors, by attorney generals at, at the state level. What would you suggest they do? Well, I think the governors like Governor Kemp in Georgia and Governor Abbott in Texas who have insisted on tightening up the rules are doing absolutely the right thing. And we need to have that in, in all the key states uh, where there tend to be very tight, closely decided elections. And is that the key, is looking for places where the elections are tight and trying to clean up the rules there? Right. The states have responsibility for that. Uh, I'm not for sending everything over to the federal government. The states each should be focused on tightening up their rules. And there was more of our exclusive interview. The former attorney general delved further into the need for regulations on big tech companies. And we also discussed a significant moment of his career, as well as a pivotal moment in U.S. history, the investigation into the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. I know the president later, after 9-11, that is H.W. Bush, when his son was dealing with 9-11, uh, uh, said in retrospect he sometimes thinks we should have been more aggressive in responding to the attack on 103. To watch my full interview with former Attorney General Bill Barr, go to the EWTN YouTube page or the EWTN News in-depth Facebook and Instagram pages. You can also find a link on our Twitter feed. Up next, Ukraine, the Pope's message, the President's message, and the voice of the people. I hope that you will never see it. I would never uh, wish anyone to see the war because it's the most frightened and scary, frightening and scary thing that I've ever seen. The plight of Ukrainian refugees. Our Colm Flynn is on the ground, listening to their stories as he travels with a group delivering humanitarian aid. He joins us from Kyiv next. Human suffering in Ukraine continues. With each passing day, we see more tragic images of death and destruction from the Russian invasion of its neighbor. As Russian troops concentrate their efforts on the eastern Donbas region, the destruction they left behind in other parts of Ukraine is revealed. This is an aerial view of the bombardment of a village just east of Kyiv, the entire community leveled. Though the Russians are gone, their footprint remains. And in Mariupol, where there reports the Russians had planned to bomb and flatten the remaining parts of the steel plant, where the last Ukrainian soldiers and Marines are holding out in the besieged port city. Hundreds of civilians are sheltering with the Ukrainian defenders in tunnels under the sprawling plant. Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed victory in Mariupol on Thursday, despite persistent fighting there and publicly called off the assault. But the blockade of the plant continues. Food and water are running out. And late this week, more potential evidence of Russian atrocities against Ukrainian civilians. These satellite images were released showing what appears to be mass graves just outside of Mariupol. Mariupol's mayor claims more than 20,000 civilians have been killed and that the Russians have brought bodies there by the truckload for disposal. All of this is strengthening the resolve of those countries that want to help Ukraine. We're not sitting on the funding that Congress has provided for Ukraine. We're sending it directly to the front lines of freedom, to the fearless and skilled Ukrainian fighters who are standing in the breach. We won't always be able to advertise everything we, uh, that our partners are doing to support Ukraine and fight for freedom. But to modernize Teddy Roosevelt's famous advice, sometimes we will speak softly and carry a large javelin, because we're sending a lot of those in as well. 
At the White House, President Joe Biden announced another $800 million package of military assistance to Ukraine. This time, it will include heavy artillery weapons and tactical drones to help in the new intensified fighting in the eastern Donbas region. The president also announced all U.S. ports will close to Russian-affiliated ships. None will be allowed to dock or access U.S. shores. May there be peace for war torn Ukraine, so sorely tried by the violence and the destruction of the cruel and senseless war into which it was dragged. Before thousands of people packed into St. Peter's Square on Easter Sunday, Pope Francis lamented what he called an Easter of war in Ukraine and around the globe. In his Urbi at Orbi blessing, he urged people to be more sensitive and attentive to situations of war and violence, not only in Europe, but around the world. And late this week, the pontiff joined the United Nations and the leader of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in calling for a four-day truce in Ukraine this weekend to mark the Eastern Orthodox Triduum and Easter. Russia rejected the Easter truce offer. EWTN News In Depth has a reporter in Ukraine right now. Colin Flynn is traveling with an American humanitarian aid group as the group delivers medicine and support to Ukrainian refugees. This woman is 85 years of age and three weeks ago she fled her home in the Donbass region after it was bombed. My house was bombed. A bomb fell and we decided to leave. The windows were blown out, the balcony collapsed. It was scary and we already had three raids in the place where I live. How do you feel seeing now what is happening to your country, Ukraine? Putin is killing Putin is killing us. I curse him. May God give him the kind of hell he's giving us. He thinks that this operation should destroy Ukraines. But we love Ukraine, we fight for Ukraine, and we will win, I think. She is just one of 170 Ukrainian refugees living here at the St. Joseph Basilian Monastery and Seminary, just outside the city of Lviv in the west of Ukraine. Most of them are women and children, and they are sheltering here from the Russian invasion in the east of the country. The parents are trying to shelter these children from the reality of war, some mothers telling their children that they've come to spend time at a resort, but they too have heard the bombs. There's a place to sleep. Food. And they also entertain us, show cartoons and give us goodies. And at least there's no banging. Why can't you go home? Why not? Because it's war now. Because everything is occupied and there is banging. There's a lot of shooting. Our houses are being taken by other people. Your father? My dad is a soldier. He is fighting in the war now. Do you miss Papa? Yeah, but you will see them soon. This seminary opened its doors to refugees, offering them a safe haven for as long as they need. Father Pantelemon Trofimov is the superior of the seminary. Lviv, where we're located, has always been regarded as a safe, as, as a safe place. Yeah, uh, we we have bombing only once a week. Yeah. Uh, no, not not like a target every, every day. But still, yeah. just a, a few days ago, the bombs hit. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's seven a, people. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they hit uh, not far from here, five uh, kilometers from, from 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 our place. Uh, missiles. Seven people were killed and uh, more than ten wounded. <laughs> one family? No. Oh, wow. Okay. In the kitchen, one entire family has gathered. They're on cooking duty tonight and they tell me about their story. We had just left and immediately our village came under fire. It was such a blessing that we left and were shelled immediately. We were jumping on the train. The volunteers were throwing us on the train with our bags and children. It was very difficult, 
very difficult. In our opinion, Russia should not even be included in history. Russia spoils history. It should be destroyed and that is all. We were happy, we were very happy, even though we lived there in Donbass and we had small salaries and didn't travel abroad, we were happy. We had a homeland, families, friends. We lived very happily. Why Russia did that, nobody knows. I don't know what to say. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to upset you, Faye. There are many smiles around here, but a lot of it is putting on a brave face. Like 21-year-old Paulina, who came here from Kiev. Was it scary when those missiles struck just a few days ago and just a few kilometers from here? I was scared uh, only for my sister, because she's three years old. She has, you see her, she's very small and very good girl. She's very shy and very light. And I didn't want her to know what war is, because now we tell her that it's not a bombshell, it's a thunderstorm and we have just a, a heavy rain here. And you just need to hide somewhere, not to hear the sound of thunder. And I'm always thinking just about her. She tells me that her mother is Russian and they don't speak to some of their cousins in Russia because they support Putin's invasion. She thinks they have been brainwashed by propaganda. Uh, when the 24th of February happened, we just uh, understood that there is only one side. We are being killed by Russian government, by Russian soldiers, and uh, they kill people, they rape people, they... Um, I, I would say this is a genocide of uh, Ukrainian... You'd say civilians. genocide, you use genocide, that word. I'm sorry, yeah, genocide, yeah. yeah. Uh, of Ukrainian civilians. Okay. Genocide. Easter, a time of hope and yeah. a, a time of new beginnings. Where can people find hope today here in Ukraine? Where but our they... hope is risen Christ. Uh, I say that uh, we should put our hope uh, in him. In Lviv, Ukraine, Colm Flynn, EWTN News in depth. Colm joins us now from Kyiv, Ukraine, with more on the pontifical mission and what he's seeing there on the ground. Colm, great to see you. So glad that you're safe. Tell us more about your journey into Ukraine. How did you get into the country? Well, thank you, Monsi, and great to talk to you too. And you're right, we came here with the Pontifical Mission Societies led by Monsignor Kieran Harrington. And the way we got in here was actually very interesting, Monsi. We flew, first of all, to Krakow in Poland. We then drove for two hours to a border crossing. We're told we could not cross there unless we had a special uh, licensed car to go across into Ukraine. So we had to drive for another hour to another border crossing called Medica. Mm -hmm. There we were able to walk across the border where a seminarian picked us up from a seminary which is in Lviv. We had to drive another two hours but the thing that was quite dangerous Monsi was that we were breaking curfew. There was a curfew here in the country at 10-11pm. Uh, we arrived at 3am in the morning into Lviv and that's where our journey began. Column, you're meeting refugees on the ground. What is your general impression of how they're feeling? Are they still in shock or are they feeling a little bit frustrated because the crisis continues? That's a great question, Monsi, and you're completely right. The attitude is different, and we're told it has been changing. At the beginning, they were scared. Uh, so much trepidation, so much anxiety, not knowing what was going to happen. But as the refugees, a lot of them have moved out of cities like Kiev, where we are now. The population has halved here in the nation's capital. As they moved from the Donbass region, many of them, from that's in the east over to the west, in cities like Lviv, where we were. Now they are in safety, although a lot of their husbands and fathers are brothers have stayed back to fight but the ones who are there and they're in they're sheltering at the moment their attitudes have turned to anger they have a deep deep anger towards Russia for what they are doing to this country and Monsi when you look around at the devastation and the destruction as we saw today you can see why they have such deep anger Eastern Orthodox Easter is this weekend the Ukrainians are expecting a very special message tailored for them from Pope Francis. What can you tell us about that? 
That's one of the incredible things here, Monsi, is that the faithful are still coming out in their droves to celebrate their Holy Week and Easter. And you're right, Pope Francis is expected to speak to their hearts this weekend. He is expected to ask for peace, to uh, appeal to them to still have hope despite the bombardment that is happening in the east, in the Donbass region, as we speak. And even yesterday, Monsi, in our car, when we were driving with the crew, we had an air raid warning on our phone for the entire nation. So the Pope is expected to appeal for peace once again and to encourage them to keep hope and to keep their faith and that hopefully peace, of course, will prevail. It's definitely heartless that they won't have a ceasefire for Easter, but we know that you're there covering everything. We're praying for you and we're pray praying for peace. Thank you, Colm. Thank you so much, Muncie. As we continue to watch this humanitarian refugee crisis, a country widely criticized just a few years ago for eventually closing its borders and stranding thousands of Syrian refugees has now stepped up to accept hundreds of thousands of fleeing Ukrainians. Hungary established a humanitarian corridor for Ukrainians, as well as third country nationals escaping Ukraine, and is welcoming them with the help of charity organizations and volunteers. From our offices at EWTN Hungary, here's reporter Domanka Spule. I'm looking for a new home out of Ukraine, mm, because my city is burned. Over 400,000 refugees have fled Ukraine to the neighboring Hungary since the beginning of the Russian invasion, making this one of the largest refugee crises in Hungary's history. The mass influx of people has been steady at the five border crossing points between the two countries. My parents are still there and I hope they will survive. Uh, I also want to come back and be help, uh, um, helpful there, useful there, but I, I, I have to... I have to think about it. I don't know what to do next. I just want to sleep and eat something and after that maybe keep moving, keep going. Like Anna, most of them are only transiting the country, but there are many refugees in Hungary's public transport centers lining up to get a ride for a better life. In the fall of 2015, during the European refugee crisis, also known as the Syrian refugee crisis, this eastern railway station of Budapest, Hungary, where I'm standing right now, was flooded with migrants and refugees coming from mainly countries in the Middle East and Africa. Now, about seven years later, the same situation has developed as refugees fleeing Ukraine arrived to the two main train stations of Budapest in the first three weeks after the outbreak of war. As a response to the needs of the refugees, Hungary reacted by setting up a humanitarian transit point where the refugees can find shelter in a more civilized environment. Monika Haidu has been working at the Hungarian Charity Service of the Order of Malta and says that in her 25 years of work experience, she has never witnessed a humanitarian crisis like this before. Here we can provide accommodation, a place to lie down and rest for the night for about 150 to 200 people. We work in shifts with the NGOs and constantly replenish our food storage. I really appreciate everything and all countries that support Ukraine um, because mm, now we can get food and water and electricity and uh, I'm really thankful for everything. At the border, the same charity organizations are also operating. The Hungarian Catholic Caritas stood by the refugees from the very first minutes. Jennifer Poydatz, Vice President for Humanitarian Response for Catholic Relief Services, came all the way from the United States to Hungary to help and oversee the work of the Catholic Charities. Over a thousand families coming across today, and all those families pass through um, Caritas reception centers after being registered um, at the border. And really well organized, a place, you know, that people can you know, just rest, um, they can have food, they can receive information on other services that are available to, him, to them. I think people feel a sense of safety and welcome um, and they do their best to yeah, help people who are really coming from a, a pretty horrific situation. The question about when the conflict will de-escalate and whether the refugees who fled Ukraine will ever be able to go back to their homeland remains open. At this point, they're driven with hope for a peaceful future. Tomorrow I want to visit uh, Zagreb. My friend uh, lives there and um, uh, maybe I will find a job uh, near um, city, see a site. 
because Mariupol situated by the sea, <laughs> by the sea, and I used to sing on the sea beach. Maybe I will find a job over there. I don't know. I will try. I will try. I will do my best. From Budapest, Hungary, Domi Pulai, EWTN News, in depth. There's much more ahead. Stay with us. I do this ministry in order to give people an experience of the living God. One priest's mission to share the saints will visit the relic exhibit that has inspired so many. As soon as I walked into the church, I was quickened in the spirit, being at peace, and became very curious about this faith. And next, we explore the rite of Christian initiation of adults with the stories of two women moved by the Holy Spirit to go through our CIA. A look at the program that has brought millions of people into the Catholic Church. The right of Christian initiation of adults, or RCIA. Millions of Americans have entered the Catholic Church through this program, allowing adults to convert to the faith after the age of infant baptism. And this is the time of year it normally happens, as the vast majority of these new converts become Catholic during the Easter Vigil. Reporter Rosel Reyes has the story of two women who felt the Holy Spirit leading them toward RCIA in this Catholic Life Report. When Jessica Bourne was at her lowest, she felt lost and didn't know who to turn to. I was going through a really hard time right towards the end of nursing school. COVID was like, you know, at its worst. And uh, I was sort of just thinking more about um, the kind of things that my family relied on doing. Coming from a family of non-practicing Catholics, she has always yearned for some kind of spiritual connection. One morning I woke up, I worked a night shift, and uh, I woke up and I just, my first thought was, I'm going to Ash Wednesday Mass. I walked in the doors and it was beautiful. Um, and I left feeling like like it was something that I wanted to do. Many adults like Jessica entering the Catholic Church or those just considering joining follow a course known as the RCIA or the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. RCIA is a faith journey for adults who desire to come into full communion with a Catholic Church. It's a process of conversion in growing a relationship with God and learning how to be a disciple. There are four stages in RCIA, each concluding with a ceremony known as a rite. RCIA normally takes about nine months, but varies from person to person. First is the pre-catechumenate stage, where people are still exploring the faith. After the rite of acceptance, next is the catechumenate stage. This is the time of learning, the basic catechesis, prayer, and the teachings of the church, leading up to the rite of election. Third is the stage of purification and enlightenment, which is the period before receiving the Easter sacraments of initiation into the church, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist. This period consists of intense spiritual reflection and prayer. Lastly, the stage of mystagogy, which is a continued reflection on the sacraments one has received and finding a place in the church community. Maria Thorson, director of RCIA at the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in Richmond, Virginia, says members form a lasting spiritual bond during weekly sessions. And that small faith community of RCIA members and their sponsors and the team um, help each other to sort of delve deeper into the relationship with God. After getting to know Jessica, Maria then matched her with her sponsor, Holly Aldridge. As a mother of two, Holly says being a sponsor lets her relive the joy she felt baptizing her sons. It's just so special to hear people's stories. Why? Why are they doing this? Why are they choosing to do this as an adult? And to just be a part of that and witness and help walk along with them is really been a blessing for me. At the culmination of the RCIA, those who wish to become Catholic are received into the church every year at the Easter Vigil Mass. Jessica, I baptize you. For me personally, it's a great source of pride 
uh, to see uh, candidates and catechumens receive their sacraments because I know that they've been preparing and I've had the chance to meet with them and listen to them and uh, assist them in some way uh, on their journeys. Like Jessica, Angela McGlowan also went through the RCIA process. You may recognize her as a commentator on another network. Angela, who was a Protestant growing up, started her spiritual journey by helping out a colleague who was in a dark place. A friend was in trouble and needed to go back to his faith, a fallaway Irish Catholic. So the Holy Spirit quickened me and said, Angela, you need to get him back to his church and you need to go with him. So we both ended up attending the Church of Immaculate Conception. This is where she met Father Charles Gallagher, who became her spiritual guide and helped her with faith formation. Angela continued attending Mass with her colleague, Jack Keane. To her surprise, her faith journey transformed into a love story. She fell in love with both the Catholic Church and her friend. So it was very special to me. That was like the culmination of I married into the faith, I became a part of the faith, and I converted on the day that I became uh, a wife. So it was, it was a, a beautiful, becoming Catholic was like a beautiful love story to me. Father Gallagher sends a message to those who show interest in the Catholic Church. My message to them is that the Catholic Church is much bigger from the inside than it is from the outside. That when they become Catholic and they, they enter in and they see how big the church is, how beautiful our traditions are, how diverse you know, our, our worship is in all the different cultures and all of our different saints and, and the spirituality of the church, that they would find a, a true spiritual home. Rosal Rages, EWTN, News in Depth. RCIA could soon be called OCIA, which stands for the Order of Christian Initiation for Adults. The move by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops was made to reflect more of the Church's original Latin roots. It's still pending final approval from the Vatican. Each parish has information on the RCIA programs they offer, but you can also learn more about the basic process of RCIA on the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops website, usccb.org. Up next, after the break, top headlines in the Week in Review. And I just want to scream and tell everybody, take those masks off. Enjoy life. Breathe. Because I couldn't breathe for two years. I'm still going to ride the train with it on. It just is a level of comfort because I'm going to visit my elderly grandmother. A big court ruling upends mask requirements around the country. We'll explain. And someone celebrating a big birthday with her birthday ponies. We'll be right back. News about changes in mask mandates tops the week in review. Mask now optional for employees, customers, following White House. <laughs> Some airline passengers cheering after airlines announced masks are no longer required. On Tuesday, a federal district judge in Florida overturned the mask mandate for airlines and other public transportation, stating the rule is unlawful and exceeds the authority of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The decision is receiving mixed reactions from Americans. I'll always wear my mask. I lost my grandmother to COVID a year ago, and so I'm very particular about the masks. So I'm going to continue to wear them no matter what the mandates are. My personal opinion, they don't they don't do much. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited. The Justice Department on Wednesday appealed the ruling following a recommendation by the CDC. The CDC said masks for indoor transportation are necessary for public health. The appeal is expected to take months. In a legal settlement, the Diocese of Camden, New Jersey, will pay nearly $88 million to roughly 300 plaintiffs who said they were victims of sexual abuse. It's among the top five payouts in abuse litigation involving the Catholic Church in America, surpassing the historic Boston Archdiocese settlement in 2003 of almost $85 million. The agreement comes after New Jersey became one of a number of states to extend its statute of limitations so that people who said they'd been sexually abused as children could sue. It's unique in that it will allow further litigation against insurance companies for the diocese and individual Catholic parishes and schools. Fifty-six priests in the Camden Diocese have been credibly accused of sexually abusing children. 
Camden Bishop Dennis Sullivan issued an apology to all victims of sexual abuse in his diocese, saying he's committed to making sure what he called this terrible chapter in history never happens again. All eyes are on France this weekend, where a crucial election for the presidency could have major repercussions for NATO, the European Union, and the war in Ukraine. President Emmanuel Macron is facing a stiff challenge from Marine Le Pen, a candidate with a history of close relations with Vladimir Putin. Le Pen says she would halt French weapons transfers to Ukraine, a country she has said that belongs in Russia's sphere of influence. Her Russian sympathies were a major focus of a heated presidential debate this week. Vous avez été, je pense, l'une des premières responsables politiques européennes dès 2014 à, à reconnaître le résultat de l'annexion de la Crimée. Macron wasted no time in mentioning Le Pen's recognition of Russia's annexation of Crimea, and he sharply criticized her for a multi-million dollar loan her political party received from a Russian bank in 2014 that has never been paid back. Le Pen said Macron was out of touch with the people and blamed him for presiding over an economy with rampant inflation. She criticized him on social issues, highlighted her anti-immigration proposals, and detailed her plans to ban Islamic women from wearing headscarves in public. Marine Le Pen explained she wanted to ban, you know, uh, the Islamic veil. Uh, and uh, uh, Macron saying that that could be a kind of enormous tension in the French society was right. We would be the only country uh, in non-Islamic countries to do this kind of prohibition. Marc Lazar, a highly respected political analyst in France, said Le Pen and the headscarf argument likely turned off Muslim voters she needs, who otherwise had come to like her populist economic programs. French voters go to the polls on Sunday, with final results expected on Monday. An important occasion of note in Britain as the country celebrated Queen Elizabeth's 96th birthday on Thursday. Cannon salutes were fired from around the country, including at the Tower of London, Windsor Castle and at Hyde Park in London. The Queen was out of the public eye, marking her birthday privately at Sandringham Estate. A grand celebration will be held in June to coincide with four days of Jubilee festivities marking her 70 years on the throne. A new photo was released on her birthday by the Royal Windsor Horse Show. Taken last month, it shows Queen Elizabeth, who is well known for her lifelong love of horses, holding the reins of two of her ponies. Pope Francis emphasizes the importance of a Catholic education and formation in a message he shared with a delegation of English-speaking Catholic universities this week. He says that a truly Catholic education means forming the head, hands, and heart together, and that professors should nurture a desire for truth, goodness and beauty in each student so they can be open to the fullness of life. The Pope said Catholic education is more important than ever in an age when information is often shared, he says, without wisdom or critical sense. A prodigal dress has returned home and could now provide important higher education funding. In 1973, the Catholic University of America received a dress likely worn by Judy Garland in the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz. The iconic Dorothy dress went missing for almost 30 years, but was found in 2021 by a faculty member. The dress, estimated to be valued around $1 million, will be up for auction in May. The proceeds will go towards the Catholic University's drama department. We do have the intercession of the saints to pray to, to heal us, to speak for us. And an exhibit that brings the saints to the people. Why it's drawing such large crowds when we return. A relic of the blessed Carlo Acutis will now be displayed in the United States. It was received from Italy by New York Cardinal Timothy Dolan earlier this month. Acutis, whose life was centered around, around his deep faith and the Eucharist, died in 2006 of leukemia at the age of 15. He's the first of his generation, the millennial generation, to be declared blessed. Pope Francis has named him the patron of the upcoming Eucharistic revival in the U.S. The relic, a fragment of his heart, will travel to every diocese in the U.S. over the next three years. Relics are a tangible way to feel close to God. And that's the mission of the priest in our next story. 
He launched a ministry devoted to sharing the stories of the saints. It's an exhibition of relics of more than 100 saints and includes another relic from the beatified Carlo Acutis. As Mark Irons explains, visiting this exhibit is a faith journey for many to meet their Catholic heroes. A crowded Catholic church with people spilling out onto the sidewalk and even more packing the nearby parish hall. It's a cold evening in the middle of a work week, but they've flocked to St. James Church in Northern Virginia to see a unique exhibit. God likes to draw attention to his saints. God, God is a proud dad. The hope is to give people an experience of God through the lives of the saints who love him. Father Carlos Martins directs this ministry called Treasures of the Church. He travels the world with more than 150 saintly relics. Relics from saints that lived in New Testament times until the most recently canonized and beatified. Can you show us some? Display tables are filled with the relics of holy men and women, including saints like Francis of Assisi, Therese of Lisieux, Kateri Tekakwitha, and Padre Pio. On the same table, I have Blessed Carlo Acutis, who is one of the most recently beatified. This is a relic of his hair, uh, provided by the kindness of his mother. Catholic relics are verified through a church process to prove their authenticity, and they are kept secure inside containers called reliquaries. This exposition is extra special because you have the chance to actually touch all of these relics and feel the powerful intercession of the saints. I guarantee people at each exposition that there's going to be at least one saint that is going to reach out and communicate with them in a personal way. We met Jim Swiger. He's had a lifelong prayerful devotion to St. Jude, one of the 12 apostles. Here, he could finally venerate the saint's relic. Having him close to me in a way that I never have before because more in a physical than just the spiritual way. And, and I found it very moving, actually. Relics come in three different classifications. A first class relic is a body part of a saint, a piece of bone or hair, blood or flesh. Second class relics are items a saint owned. Third class relics are objects the saint has touched or items touched to a first or second class relic. The majority of the relics these visitors will encounter are first class. It's a great reminder of like the presence of, you know, the saints and Jesus uh, in my life and in, in the world. So just like the physical presence. I think it just points us to people who have walked this earth before us and who have lived the lives of faith, struggle, sadness. In any of the ailments that we experience today, they've had too. In addition to the saints, relics directly related to Jesus and Mary. The highlights of this exhibit, a piece of the Blessed Virgin Mary's veil and wood from the cross Jesus was crucified on. The impact on those who come here can be profound. God likes to work the miraculous in the presence of relics. Father Martins told us he's heard many accounts of spiritual, emotional, or physical healing. Relics are not magic. They don't have a power of their own. They are not a power separate from God. So any healing that happens in the presence of relics is God's doing. We got in touch with a lady who says she did experience a miraculous uh, healing. A good description of the pain would be sharp and searing. For weeks, a nerve injury was causing Catherine Contrell debilitating back pain. She had to walk with a cane. A parishioner at St. Philip Church outside Nashville, Tennessee, Cantrell went to the Treasures of the Church Relic Exposition when it came to her parish last month. She didn't go looking to be healed, but she lined up to venerate the wood of the true cross. When I got to the relic, it was just this overwhelming sense of peace that I can't explain. And I placed my hand, you know, on top of the reliquary and the Holy Spirit spoke and said, do you want to be healed? And I said, yes, Lord, I do. At that point, I realized I had no pain. I could walk. I could walk straight um, without any kind of leaning or, or discomfort. And I, and I just was like, thank you, God. There is biblical proof of healing in the presence of relics, including the gospel story of a woman healed after touching just the cloak of Jesus. Father Martins says the miracles Christ can work are not a thing of the past. The faith spread throughout the world in large part because of the signs and wonders that, that he accomplished. If we aren't expecting those, well, we shouldn't be surprised when they don't occur. Michelle Sheehan came here to spend time with the saints. 
After a near-death experience in a car crash a few years ago, she says her faith has grown and her spiritual life is most important. Her main goal now... Driven person, but the only thing that I ever want to do now is just be a saint. <laughs> Anything else I achieve in life is... Um, it's If God wants me to achieve it, I'll achieve it. But other than that, to be a saint. She's drawing inspiration from the lives of holy men and women represented in this room. And we met 10-year-old Nicholas Godoy, excited to visit the relic of St. Jerome. He was a great writer. He was really humble. He, he didn't care about earthly pleasures. And this young Catholic reminded us the ancient proof of faith is fully alive today. We have them right there in the relics, the history of our faith. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. Father Martins is sharing his exhibit in Europe right now with stops in France and Italy. You can find out more about the schedule of this tour when it returns to the United States in May and how to bring it to your local parish by visiting treasuresofthechurch.com. That's it for us this week. I'm Monse Alvarado. We hope to see you back same time next week as we bring you more in-depth coverage of stories important to your Catholic life. See you then.